Hello, this is Dr. Ruby, and welcome to the first part of the lecture for Module 2. In this lecture, we will discuss Chapter 6 in your textbook. Chapter 6 describes the various types of joints found in the human body. Joints can be classified based on their physiology or their function, which for a joint consists of what type of movement it allows and how much it moves. The three major categories classified by function are synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. Joints can also be classified based on their anatomy or their structure. The three major categories of joints classified by structure are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. The next two slides describe the objectives of Section 6.1 of Chapter 6. Your textbook has a list of key terms and word origins for each chapter. Most of these terms will become familiar as the material is covered, but reviewing them, especially the word origins, before reading the chapter can be very helpful. If you have not done so, done so yet, I would recommend that you check into the Evolve website that's offered with your textbook and see the terms and descriptions that they offer for you there. There are also some practice questions and uh, reading that can be helpful to your studying. Here are the additional objectives. The anatomy of a joint. Well, basically, you look at a joint, and a joint is a juncture between two or more bones. Stru this, it has a structural classification. It can be fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. Another name for a joint is an articulation, or basically where two bones come together. The components of a typical joint are bone, muscle, ligament, fibrous capsule, synovial membrane, articular cartilage, and the joint cavity. The main function of a joint is to allow movement, and the word allow must be emphasized here. Joints do not create movement. That's the job of muscles. Joints are passive structures, and ligaments and joint capsules limit movement. Every joint balances stability and mobility. They are more mobile and less stable or more stable and less mobile. Their most stable position is described as the closed pack position and their least stable position as described as the open pack position. Mobility and stability are antagonistic concepts. More of one means less of the other. What is the position of the bones when a joint is closed packed? In a closed pack position, the bones are in, a, in a joint are maximally congruent or very, very stable. The figure on the left shows the shallow socket of the shoulder joint. The figure on the right shows the deep socket of the hip joint. As a result, the shoulder joint allows greater mobility while the hip has greater stability. The shoulder joint is less stable and the hip joint is less mobile. All joints absorb shock, especially the spine and the lower extremities. There is an equivalent force in walking or jumping. Think of a car's shock absorbers. That's how these joints function. When we push off the ground as we walk, run, or jump, an equivalent force moves upward through our bodies, and joints help to absorb these forces. If you look in this picture, the joints absorbing shock are the hip, the knee, and the ankle. Many joints bear the body's weight. Weight-bearing joints are more stable and less mobile. This includes all of the joints of the lower extremities and the spine. The amount of stress that a weight-bearing joint must bear is greater for the joints that are in the lower body. The joints in the ankle and foot bear the greatest weight for this reason. In this photo, the weight-bearing joints are highlighted in blue and they include the joints of the feet, the ankles, hips, and the spine. These are the objectives for section 6.2. I recommend that you read through the objectives and as you read the chapter and study the lecture that you are sure that you can do the things listed in the objectives. This way you'll be ready for the quiz and ready to move on throughout the chapter.
Again, here are more objectives. Please make sure that you can answer these objectives so that you understand the modules that will, that will come later in the course. Joint classification. Joints may be classified both structurally and functionally. Structural classification of joints includes fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. Fibrous joints are held together with a dense fibrous connective tissue. Cartilaginous joints are held together by fibrocartilage or hyaline cartilage, and synovial joints are connected by joint capsules filled with synovial fluid. Joints without a joint cavity include fibrous and cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints all have a fluid-filled cavity. Synovial joints contain an outer fibrous layer and an inner synovial layer. These classifications correspond to the amount of movement allowed by the joint. Synarthrotic joints allow little to or no movement and diarthritic joints allow a great deal of movement. Fibrous joints are dense, fibrous connective tissue. They have little or no movement. There are three types, syndesmosis joints, suture joints, and gomphosis joints. The inner osseous membrane between the radius and the ulna is a type of fibrous joint. Here are some pictures of a syndesmosis type joint. Syndesmosis joints only permit a small amount of movement. Functionally, the inner osseous membrane that unites the radius and the ulna in the wrist is a synarthritic joint, but structurally it is a fibrous syndesmosis joint. Syndesmosis joints are characterized by dense fibrous connective tissue that unites the bones in a joint. Another type of uh, fibrous joint is a suture joint, and they are generally considered to allow little or no movement in later life. A good example is the suture joint in the skull. There is little to no agreement on whether or not a suture joints move in adults. Some say no. A major premise of the craniosacral joint is that suture joints allow movement. Part of their technique is to manipulate the bones that suture joints to aid the movement of cerebrospinal fluid. However, the study of the skull of adults shows that these joints do tend to become fused over with bone as we get older. The last type of fibrous joint is the gomphosis joint, and they are only found between the teeth and the mandible, or the teeth and the maxilla. In adults, no movement is permitted in a gomphosis joint. Now let's discuss cartilaginous joints. These allow a moderate but limited amount of movement. There are two types, symphysis joints and synchondrosis joints. Cartilaginous joints have no joint cavities. They also allow a moderate amount of movement. They are classified as amphiarthritic since they allow a moderate amount of movement. In symphysis joints, fiber cartilage in the form of a disc unites the bodies of two adjacent bones. For example, on the left, the diagram shows the joints between the vertebrae. You can see the intervertebral disc. The photo on the right shows the symphysis pubis, where we can see there is also cartilage there between the bony structures. Here are some examples of synchondrosis joints, including the hyaline cartilage connecting the ribs to the sternum and the growth plates that occur next to developing long bones. Now let's take a look at synovial joints. These are the joints that most people think of when they think of joints. What is the difference between a synovial cavity and the joint cavity? Well, actually there is no difference. These two terms refer to the same structure. On the left, you see a frontal plane cross-section view of the shoulder joint. And below is a sagittal plane cross-section view of the elbow joint. These are both synovial joints, and you can see the synovial, ca the synovial cavity.
here is a sagittal cross-plane section of the knee joint. Again, you can see the synovial cavity. There are four categories of synovial joints, uniaxial, biaxial, triaxial, and non-axial. On this slide you see listed the objectives for Lesson 6.3. There are more on the next slide. Please remember that you can use these objectives to ensure that you are learning what you should be learning from this section of the course. Some of this information will be on the quiz, but more of it will reoccur as the course proceeds. Now let's discuss the types of synovial joints. A uniaxial synovial joint has two types of motion around one axis. Examples of these are hinge joints and pivot joints. A hinge joint is also known as a ginglimus joint. And a pivot joint is also known as a trochoid joint. These are both examples of uniaxial synovial hinge joints. Both diagrams A and B are examples of uniaxial synovial pivot joints. A shows the anti-atlantoaxial <laughs> joint, and figure B shows the proximal radioulnar joint of the forearm. Biaxial joints have two types of motion around two axes. They, they include condyloid joints and saddle joints. Condyloid joints are also known as ovoid joints or elliptical joints, and saddle joints are also known as cellar joints. In a condyloid joint, one bone is convex in shape and the other bone is concave in shape. An example of a condyloid joint is the metacarpophalangeal joint of the hand. A saddle joint is a modified condyloid joint. Instead of having one convex shaped bone that fits into a concave shaped bone, both bones of a saddle joint are shaped such that each bone has a convexity and a concavity to its surface. Saddle joints are similar in structure and function to a person sitting on a western saddle on a horse. The thumb joint is a good example of a saddle joint. Triaxial synovial joints are ball and socket joints. One bone has a convex ball that fits into another bone's concave socket. Two examples are the shoulder joint and the hip joint. Figure A on this slide shows an anterior view of the shoulder joint. Figure B shows flexion and extension of the arm at the shoulder joint within the sagittal plane around a mediolateral axis. Figure C on this slide shows abduction and adduction of the arm at the shoulder joint in the frontal plane around an anterior posterior axis. Figure D shows medial rotation and lateral rotation of the arm at the shoulder joint in the transverse plane around a vertical axis. As you can see, the triaxial synovial joints have multiplanar, multi-axis motions. Non-axial synovial joints allow motion within a plane, not around an axis. They are also known as a gliding joint, an irregular joint, or a plane joint. They are sometimes called gliding joints because the surface of one bone translates or glides along the surface of its neighbor. Here are some examples of non-axial synovial joints. These illustrations show the joint between two carpal bones and a facet joint between a cervical vertebrae. Menisci and articular discs are often within the joint. Here we see the ring-shaped articular disc and the crescent-shaped meniscus. 
By improving the congruence of a joint using a meniscus and articular disc, we help to maintain normal joint movements. They also cushion the joint and act as shock absorbers. Here are some examples of joints with menisci and articular discs. A is a posterior medial view of the knee joint, and B is a proximal superior view of the tibia. Note the two menisci. That's the end of our discussion for Chapter 6.